Thank you, Roby. Well, well, John, I'm going to start broad, but then I'm going to get back to the subject that everyone's talking about now, CO2. So that's uh, where we're going to end up here. Um, let me back up here. I just want to talk some about our perspective on the regulatory challenges. So this is going to be broad, but as I said, I'll spend a lot of the time talking about uh, sort of CO2. This shouldn't be news to any in the utility space. There's lots of sort of challenges, risks, and uncertainties. So we have new regulations, the ones we're, we've been talking about here. Uh, I'll talk some more in depth in a minute about those. Different policies, compliance is always an issue. Um, you know, how in this sort of changing world do we maintain compliance? So particularly for coal plants, your scrubbers, your SCR is much easier if you're running them steadily as compared to what I spoke about earlier today, uh, ramping them up and down. Uh, biggest two issues for our customers are reliability and costs. So we're sort of not thought about as long as we're there, but as soon as the lights go out, it sort of interrupts modern life like we never would have guessed once upon a time. So it's, it's no longer that I can't, um, so, or that my VCR is blinking 12 when the power blinks. Now it's my clocks don't work, my microwave, <coughs> TV's messed up, my Wi-Fi's messed up, and so we take that very seriously. So we have an obligation. We're a monopoly utility here in Georgia and the other s southeastern states, and so for our customers' benefit, reliability is so sort of what we try to do the best we can. The costs associated with that are balanced with reliability, but all of these uncertainties have the potential to increase those costs, obviously. And so in that regard, we worry about stranded investments. So when we talk about 111D, we have a plan where we look at the value of our assets and should we invest capital. So MATS, we made decisions. I spoke earlier about some of the retirements uh, we're doing because of MATS. Um, the 111D proposal sort of upends all of that with a very steep change of that, that uh, some of the investments that we've made to date are threatened. Very good investments on uh, very state-of-the-art controls at coal-fired power plants. But the 111D rule may make those plants uh, uh, not able to function anymore. <clears throat> so the changing markets, not such a big issue for Southern Company and a monopoly, but um, when we hear about the transmission organization, the RTOs and the ISOs, they have a much bigger problem trying to implement 111D than a monopoly utility would have just because everything's so disconnected, the generation from the transmission from the end users. I spoke earlier about renewables. Uh, we see this as a big opportunity. Um, we want to play in the renewable space when it makes sense for our customers. Um, it's starting to make sense now. Uh, here in Georgia, we're, we have uh, just uh, so, sort of had a uh, request for proposals and have granted some contracts and some power purchase agreements to buy uh, solar. Uh, in Alabama and Georgia, we're buying wind from uh, Oklahoma and Kansas. So we're fairly high on solar potential here. Wind's not so great in the southeast, uh, at least in the southern part of the U.S. Uh, talked a little bit about cost and rate increases, but the uncertainties of all of this. So you have sort of don't know what's going on in a number of these. Uh, five years ago, I used to always say, tell me the price of natural gas into the future, and every decision I make as a utility will be exactly right. I still need to know that, but I need to know lots of other things now uh, to, to, to make that happen. And so it's just, it's an increasing sort of set of complexity of things I need to know to run my business efficiently so that I can deliver affordable, reliable, safe, uh, clean electricity to my customers. So going a little bit deeper here, the regulatory environment, it seems to be accelerating. Maybe that's just my sort of perception of it, but, uh, you know, we naively once upon a time thought once we installed state-of-the-art SCRs and state-of-the-art scrubbers on our plants that, that we would then be controlled and we could operate those. Well, that was obviously naive because we talk about mercury and air toxics and now sort of 111D. So the, the regulatory envi environment is sort of like a nylon cable tie. From our point of view, it just keeps getting tighter and tighter and never any looser. So, so we're sort of learning how to deal with that. Uh, talk a little bit more in depth about the climate action plan in the, in the slides to come. Um, the third bullet there, we think coal is essential to the U.S. energy mix. Um, our stated corporate philosophy is we want all of the above. We think a portfolio approach to managing our energy resources is the right way to go. So we do coal, we do natural gas, we do nuclear, we do renewables. 
The, the company started as a renewable company doing hydroelectric uh, uh, plants over 100 years ago. Um, also, we want our customers to use our product as efficiently as possible. So one of the things for a monopoly utility is Georgia Power operates in Georgia. We can't move to California, we can't move to the Far East. So for Georgia Power to be successful, Georgia has to be successful. And so a company that doesn't use electricity efficiently uh, won't be competitive and that doesn't help us at all. Um, one other thing to think about coal is every time I drive by a coal-fired power plant and I see a big pile of coal out there, it's like I'm crossing uh, Death Valley and I know I have a full tank of gas. So natural gas plants provide just-in-time electricity with just-in-time natural gas. Uh, something interrupts on the natural gas, it interrupts the electricity. We'll have coal out there for several weeks that we can run that plant without any other deliveries from that. So it's, it's sort of an under, uh, never seen sort of stability to the economy that as we get further and further away from coal, we won't be able to rely on anymore. Uh, we talked about energy storage earlier. That might help, but I don't ever think I'm gonna have a place to store electrical energy for 40 days or 50 days the way I can put a coal pile at my power plant. So that's sort of my coal commercial. Um, and that's part of energy security. You know, we have enough coal to last this economy at reasonable growth rates for at least a century, if not two. So if we can find the right way to use it, we probably ought to use it there. Uh, it, it also lends to economic stability because that keeps the price of other uh, energy sources sort of mitigated with that. Um, energy diversity, it's just you can't predict what's going to happen. So we saw in the polar vortex, Limitations on natural gas uh, in New England, prices over $100 a, a million BTU, uh, sort of 25, 30 times what we've been seeing lately for that. Um, uh, our different ways of providing electricity means that we never exactly have it right, but we don't have it wrong ever. We have uh, the ability to sort of switch back and forth. I'll talk some more about that in, in a little while. Um, we think there's a great opportunity. So as our electricity generating fleet becomes lower and lower intensity carbon, which is the way we're going, we think there's an opportunity to electrify other parts of the economy. So the one we're working on here, and has actually turned out to be very popular in Georgia, is electric cars. Um, that is a way that's a, sort of a win-win for the consumer, the environment, um, and, and just provides a sort of envir very environmentally friendly because of the air quality issues in major cities for that. Um, we always worry about our transmission system and particularly going forward with the natural gas infrastructure. Is there enough supply uh, of natural gas? Well, we think so with hydrofracking. What we worry about is there enough transportation to get it from where it is to where we need it to be. That was the problem for New England in the cold weather was not enough pipeline infrastructure. So. If we think about 111D, one of the building blocks is to run natural gas power plants at a higher capacity factor than we do now. Well, the question is, do we have the gas infrastructure to do that? Are we willing to put up with the, the uh, potential sort of supply issues with that that could then threaten the reliability of the uh, uh, electricity supply? So uh, uh, Janet and, and Roby both mentioned national budgets for coal research. So we've been a supporter uh, of DOE. We've worked with DOE on SCR systems, on scrubbers, on mercury control, on carbon capture and sequestration. We think the payoffs for the general public uh, and the economy are sort of uh, at least 10 to one um, on the investment of DOE in this space. So uh, I would encourage all of you to sort of think about how can you help us support sort of continued research and continued research funding to bring about these technologies. Um, and, and finally, just uh, as we further and further control these coal plants, there's less and less benefit for every dollar we invest that way. Um, we're, at some point, we get to the law of diminishing returns. I've got state-of-the-art controls. Um, the diminishing returns are, do I have to add a whole new scrubber in parallel to what I have now to go from 95% capture to 98% capture? So these are the challenges. If you haven't seen this sort of list, uh, I'll just walk through it very briefly. Um, 
you can see the uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards. That's local air quality. That's ozone, uh, PM. Uh, we think uh, e the uh, e EPA is about to issue a new standard for ozone that will tighten that up and require another set of actions on the whole economy, whether it's transportation, utilities, or industrial sort of thing. I think most of you are familiar with the mercury and air toxic standards that we're putting into place right now. Um, precipitated an unprecedented wave of coal plant retirements that are still uh, sort of ongoing. Particularly painful when we look at it here, we lose typically some of the highest paying jobs in a community when we do that. And the communities have come to rely on the tax base of that asset there. And as we shut down those coal plants, um, you know, we wish it wasn't true, but we devastate local county governments, local city governments by uh, the tax base going away. Um, the effluent guidelines, 316B water, you know, water is going to be for five years from now here, we're probably talking water as well in a big, big way because of those rules coming up. Greenhouse gases, the rest of the talk, I'm going to delve into that. But still don't forget about visibility and regional haze. That's still a requirement out there that, uh, that actually stretches way into the future. I think uh, the final compliance data, as I recall, is like 2047 for, for visibility issues. And then fly ash, sort of a big, big issue that uh, we're about to see what the final regulations will be uh, come uh, December of this year. So let's move from the general and let's just start talking about greenhouse gases. So I uh, apologize, I wasn't here earlier, so if uh, this is a repeat, I'll go through it quickly. There's actually really three proposals that are part of the Climate Action Plan that have to do with utilities and greenhouse gases. Up on the top right are new source standards. And so these are the standards that require carbon capture and sequestration on new coal plants. Um, the modified and reconstructed sources is, is for major, major, major rebuilds of those. Um, and the one we've talked about the most this morning is uh, the 111D or the existing sources. And you can see the timeline I have there. We have the proposal from June. EPA has said they, they plan to finalize that in June of, of this coming year. States will have one year to submit a plan uh, that, that has to be approved and then uh, uh, we have to comply as utilities with that. Uh, states can get a year extension for that plan. And if they decide to go with multi-state plans, can get even another year. So it could be as late as uh, 2018 when multiple states may submit a plan. Um, it's a pretty short time frame, to be honest. And I'll talk about that at the very end of my talk. Uh, ironic thing here is some of the new source uh, performance standards. The actual number, the pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour numbers are, are uh, less stringent for a new source than they are some of the state averages. That's true here in Georgia. The, the proposed standard by EPA, the number is less, therefore more stringent than the new or the modified and reconstructed source is there. So not that they interplay at all, but it's just an interesting ju uh, juxtaposition for that. Um, What's our reaction to it? What's Southern Company's reaction to it? Um, we've said this in many different forums here, sort of three things we say about it. It's an overreach by EPA. Um, it is not a source-based standard. Um, it's unworkable from our point of view. You can't put all these pieces together the, uh, through an environmental regulation to do that. It's in some sense energy policy through an environmental approach for that. And we don't think it's good for our customers. We don't think it's good for reliability. We don't think it's the right thing to do right now for cost, given the struggles we have in the economy for that. So, so those three things we say about it. Um, <coughs> so, so some more uh, sort of comments on it there. It's a very long, complex proposal. We find that it's the most complicated thing we've encountered and even thought about from an environmental perspective. We're struggling with how to assess its impacts because it ranges over the whole economy, uh, influences our customers, our suppliers. Um, we're still looking for, for some of the supporting documents from EPA. Um, they ran a number of, of cases in their integrated planning model case, but have only uh, sort of publicly distributed the results for four of the 25 of those. Uh, some of the heat rate calculations I'll talk about in a minute, um, we're still looking for the details they used on those. So we still try to get that. Uh, December the 1st, we're, we're working as hard as we can, working weekends, nights, trying to get our comments together for that. And we, our comments will be extensive. They'll be legal, they'll be technical. Um, 
It's based on these uh, four building blocks, right? Um, so let's talk about you set the way EPA has structured this, they use the four building blocks to set a number, but then your compliance and the way the state insists on compliance is completely separated from that. It's just, that's the way they came up with the number, but it's helpful to talk about the building blocks. So the first one is heat rate, a 6% in, uh, improvement in heat rate. Well, we would be terrible power plant operators if that was available to us and we hadn't already taken advantage of it. So we have heat rate engineers. We've been chasing heat rate efficiency for 20 something years. Um, when we install scrubbers, we typically do a lot of efficiency upgrades to recover the 1% or better station service that requires. So in one sense, we don't think you could do that much even on an old plant, but certainly not on our flagships that are well controlled. We've already done all of that sort of work. It's kind of crazy. Um, the other thing is if you're gonna run coal plants less and run the gas plants more, your heat rate's gonna get worse. We all know that if you're running at lower loads, and particularly if you're moving loads around a lot, that's the most inefficient way to operate it. You only have to think about the sticker on your new car. You've got a city mileage and a highway mileage. Highway mileage is always, you get more miles per gallon on highway because you're at a steady state and you're operating there, not stopping and starting. And so that's really the, the argument about the heat rate uh, issue there. The second one is redispatch of natural gas plants. Um, this is probably one of the biggest sort of authority issues that we would say. Um, we operate our whole fleet across Southern Company, all as one fleet, and we dispatch based on economics. So it matters what the price of fuels are and the price to generate that with. And that's, that's how the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and our state commissioners have told us to run our fleet. This would turn that on its head. You would run natural gas preferentially regardless of its price. Why is that important? For us, it always comes back to the customers. Natural gas prices were low in 2012. Um, and so in 2012, we ran our natural gas plants. We ran them, and because of that fuel savings, our customers saved $1 billion that year in fuel costs because we were able to run natural gas when it was cheap. Well, let's come to this year in January, the polar vortex. Gas prices were high. We ran our coal plants the first quarter, saved our customers $100 million by using the coal plants instead of burning the more expensive natural gas. So that is the context the authority of the state uh, used to tell us how to run our system. This turns it on its head. We would run the natural gas plants regardless of the price in that case. And like I said earlier, we don't know about the infrastructure. The gas lines in the southeast are fully subscribed. So if we wanted to get more gas, we have to build more gas lines. I think the gas is available, but it's not available right here where we sit. Um, third building block, uh, nuclear and renewables. So I'll back up and say Southern Company works in all these building blocks. This is just good utility practice. This one in particular, new nuclear and renewables, um, I want to talk a little more about. So Georgia, uh, Georgia Power with uh, some partners that are here in the room are building new nuclear plants. The first in a generation, uh, our Vogel units three and four here in Georgia. Uh, Georgia Power proposed to the Public Service Commission here that we build that, anticipating future carbon regulations as a possibility. So it's a low carbon source, um, a good diversification. As our fleet has grown without adding new nuclear, our nuclear share has dropped and we wanted to build that back. Well, <clears throat> in this process, we should get credit for that forward thinking, that investment, the cost our customers are paying. Well, in only the way the government can work, the fact that we had committed to do that makes the standard more stringent in Georgia than it would be otherwise. So it just makes it harder for us to comply, not easier. So it penalizes sort of early action for that. So we've asked them, uh, the same is true for TVA building nuclear in Tennessee and in South Carolina as well. So all the states have talked to each other, all the companies have talked to each other with the nuclear industry, and we said this is not the right way to do it. Only the government can give you credit that makes it harder to do something. Um, Renewables, um, re renewables, we do what we can, but uh, we're just now seeing the price breaks we need to put that into practice. Um, EPA has applied to the Southeast a North Carolina standard of 10%. Without looking at the uh, off-ramp for cost increases that New uh, North Carolina requires in their state program and the ability to buy out of the, the state to do that. So it's a misapplication of the renewable standard in uh, North Carolina to sort of insist upon 10% renewable generation in the building blocks here. 
The, the last one I'll talk about is energy efficiency. I mean, who can be against energy efficiency? We want our customers to use our product efficiently. We have services here in Georgia. I talk about Georgia a lot because I worked at Georgia Power for a few years. Uh, we have auditors go out and look at your house and tell you how uh, you can save energy with that. We have an active energy efficiency program there. Um, what, th what EPA's proposal in the building block is, we need to do that five times as much and sustain it uh, for decades into the future. Um, we can do more. How do we do energy efficiency? We offer incentives for low-cost light bulbs, rebates if you put an efficient uh, heat pump in, or if you switch to a heat pump uh, water heater, um, those sort of things. Well, at the heart of it, that's a capital expenditure. So to do energy efficiency requires upfront capital if you're a homeowner. Middle class folks like us that own our homes, we can consider that, do it if it makes sense. Um, and so we can get a certain amount of energy efficiency. Once we get to that next tranche of energy efficiency, it's gonna be much more expensive for us to give incentives to people to do it. Um, one of the things we worry about, aggressive energy efficiency goals, and this is what the Public Service Commission in Georgia and our other states weigh, is how much it, does it cost your other customers? We had a question about environmental justice a minute ago. This is broader than the way I traditionally think of environmental justice, but the same sort of thing. So Southern Company's customers, our residential customers, 46% of our customers have household incomes of $40,000 or less. So energy costs really matter to them. And so if all of us take the incentives to do energy efficiency and lower our uh, use of electricity, all of those costs will then go on that lower income segment who are traditionally renters who can't do capital expenditures to reduce their energy supply because they don't own the building. And the owners of the buildings over here, they don't pay the, the bills, so they don't have an incentive to make them energy efficiency. So we just think there's a fundamental sort of ceiling to what we can do for energy efficiency. Not that we're opposed to it, but we just can't do the aggressive terms from 111D. Um, so the third bullet, aggressive assumptions create stringent goals, erode state flexibility. So again, you just get a number you can apply with in any way you want, but if you build it with an aggressive assumption for each one of the possible ways you can do it, you don't have a lot of flexibility. Um, stringency and flexibility don't go together. Um, I, I sort of use the analogy is you can have anything you want for supper tonight, but here's a hamburger bun and a half pound of hamburger. <clears throat> but you have all the flexibility that you want there. Um, so we talked about the building blocks. Um, in some sense, the 111D stands this rule on its head. So EPA, according to the statute, prevent, uh, presents guidelines to the states. The states use those guidelines considering what is going on in their state to produce standards of performance and then implement those standards of performance. So the number EPA is putting out should truly be thought about as a guideline and not a requirement for that in, in our opinion. Um, EPA's compliance modeling. So now I'm switching from how did they set the standard to how do you comply with it? So they ran their optimized economic model for Southern Company, and we've dug through all the numbers and all the sheets trying to figure out what it means for us. They say for Southern Company that we will retire lots of coal plants, build lots of natural gas plants, and do a lot of energy efficiency. And that's the way we'll get from where we are now to 2030 in compliance. So one thing to remember with this is this is a stringent rule, but it actually starts January 1 of 2020. So I can show you the Georgia numbers, show you the calculations, I'm not gonna do that, but if I look at the way the numbers work, I have gotta do 80% of the work before 2020 to be in compliance with the interim year goals. So if, if, if my goal to get to in 2030 is 100%, I gotta do 80% of it before I get there. So it's not a glide path, it's a crash off of a cliff and then a slight ramp to get there. So back, back to the, their suggestions of what I might do, it's to retire 9,000 megawatts of coal across the Southeast before 2020. Build 5,400 megawatts of natural gas uh, to uh, uh, supplant that. So I better have permits in hand already if I'm gonna meet that. Um, I talked about cost and reliability. So I would say more time is needed at every step in this process. 
we need more time for comments because we've never seen anything this complex. We're struggling with how to model it to try to compare our numbers to EPA model, uh, numbers. We think EPA will get so many comments that they need to take time to consider those comments. So however much time we spend in doing the comments, they need to look at every comment, com consider every comment. We think rushing it out next summer is probably uh, too fast. And certainly the biggest issue is states need time to develop an implementation plan. Trying to do this in a year, or even trying to do a multi-state one in a couple years is not gonna work. Um, the states we talk to in our service territory, they're, they're overwhelmed by this rule. How can the State Environmental Protection Agency deal with this? Um, further on the time sort of thing, we need time as utilities to do compliance once we understand what the approved state plan is by EPA. So again, this is a different rule. EPA has guidelines. The state develops a plan, EPA approves the plan, and then we try to comply with it. And so all these will happen simultaneously with the, the calendar that EPA has laid out. Uh, my last slide, and this again is just more Southern Company commercial stuff, um, we need a full portfolio of uh, energy resources. We're doing new nuclear. We're doing the 21st century coal. The question earlier uh, about byproduct, Kemper County, we think is that. We're doing, we're doing natural gas with state-of-the-art facilities. Uh, the renewables, energy efficiency, we're doing all that now. So it's not that the building blocks are, we're not doing any of it. We just can't do all that much and we can't do that much in that time frame. And beyond that, it's not legal for EPA to insist on that. More time is needed. I just went through the litany of that. Come back to what we talked about again. If we're gonna make this transition to lower carbon, we need research. We need research and development. Uh, it's for the good of the public that we do this research. And so just like Janet was talking about the natural gas industry, the renewables, we need the energy industry to have sort of public private partnerships to develop these technologies to benefit all of us. Um, the grid and particularly the gas pipeline system will have to be expanded uh, to go in this direction. Um, and finally, we're just gonna have to work together if we're gonna go through this process and try to make this transition happen there. So it's just so unpredictable about what's going on. Um, it's anybody's guess, but hopefully I've uh, been fairly clear about what our thoughts on the proposal. We're gonna file our comments December 1st. They'll be extensive, be a, uh, uh, 200, 250 pages, I think. So with that, I'll stop and see if there's any questions. Questions? That was too negative. No. <laughs> yes. And, and I have to say, I, I agree with a lot of what, what, what you're saying right now. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but knowing all this going forward, what do you think, I know, I know it's a really tough question, but what do you think will, would Southern will actually end up retiring as far as the coal plants, a magnitude number? Is it gonna be anywhere near what EPA is saying, or is it gonna be much more conservative? I don't think it'll be anywhere near that number. Um, you know, that 9,000 includes uh, the largest coal plant in our system. We operate with partners, which is the most controlled plant in the country. It's got SCRs, uh, ESPs, bag houses, and wet scrubbers on it there. And, and it's one of our newest sets of generations. So I don't think we'll retire near that many. So we'll have several different activities going on. One will be, uh, I think as Ken hinted earlier, just this grand legal battle that's about to start. And we'll see how that plays out. Um, we're going to make um, very significant comments to the pieces of the rule, trying to make the rule more workable the way it exists. Even if we think that it's not legal on that, I don't want, like to predict what the courts will do. So we're working at that level too. And so we'll, we'll see as we go along. Um, personally, I, I think it's I think it's a waste for society to take perfectly good industrial assets and throw them away to build new industrial assets to replace them. You know, some would argue you get jobs that way, but you never increase your wealth by breaking things um, to repair them. And so, yeah, there'll be some jobs, but there's lots of lost jobs and lots of, as I mentioned earlier, lots of economic uh, downturn uh, issues for places where we, uh, take those plants in and shut them down. So, you know, hard to make a prediction at this point. It's just hard for me to believe that we could make a transition in that time frame of that magnitude and keep the lights on. Any other questions? 
There's one in, in the back. Leonard Hopkins, Southern Illinois Power. Do you draw a line on the comments you make and what you preserve to use in the coming lawsuit? No, uh, <clears throat> we typically tend to put everything out there in our comments and they'll be publicly available after we file those. So we will, it, we'll have an extensive sort of set of the legal side of things. So, so one, of the, one of the issues about challenging these rules is just if you don't supply your argument in your comments, then you have a very hard time bringing it into the court side of things. So, you know, if you're anticipating comments, it's our belief that you ought to put everything into your comments, whether it's legal, technical, so that it gives you all the options in a, in a legal proceeding to raise it at a later date. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, the question was about the election and the Senate changing hands, what that may change for things. Um, I, I'm a terrible political predictor. Um, I can say just that this is all inside the administration. So e EPA asserts their right to make a rule under this section, has proposed it, will finalize it, and there's not really any legislative action other than sort of a congressional review. And there's just not that much of a majority on the other side to, to sort of stop it from happening. Well, well, the states are independent, and, so, and so, you know, they ask those questions. Can you go ahead? And oh, I'm sorry. Re, re, re so, so, so the question was, uh, how aligned are the comments for the states along with southern companies? Um, so obviously in the states we operate, um, our sort of public utility commissions, um, and, and we work very close together because we're in business together. They look over everything we do. So we, we have a lot of dialogue back and forth, but they're completely independent. The state agencies there, the, the environmental protection agencies are independent. We encourage them to file comments and, and try to give them our thoughts, but there's no way we can sort of coordinate them together. <laughs> 